like the 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 idea of God and and who and what and where and when God might be is actually plastic that it actually takes different forms. Okay. Okay. 1 2 ready go. Welcome to the Called to Be Bad podcast. My name is Mariah Martin and I feel called to be bad. It turns out I'm not the only one. Join us as we dig into all things bad, scandalous, deviant, You know, the stuff that makes good church folks squirm in the sanctuary. Why? Well, because sometimes the scandalous is spiritual, deviant is divine, and bad is beautiful. Say yes to the call and let's see what holy trouble we get into today. Hello, Maria. Hi, Mariah. How are you? I love how we have we have the Mar- we have Maria and Mariah today. Oh, yeah, I was saying that before we got started. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Call to Be Bad. Thank you. Yeah, why don't you just go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit? Tell us about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, like you said, my name's Maria Francesca French, and essentially, um, in a sentence, I would call myself a post-Christian thinker and writer. That is probably the most succinct succinct yet sort of general way of sort of describing what I do, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, I do a lot of work around what it looks like to engage faith after Mm -hmm. traditional notions of Christianity or after you've moved on from you know, the interventionist big God in the sky type of thing. Most mm-hmm. people think the thing after that is atheism, but it's actually just a different sort of faith, a faith that is rooted and grounded in where, you know, you've just been and where you might be going. And of course it's, it's bigger than that. And we'll get into some of it, but that's why I call it post-Christian because we're sort of mm-hmm. living in light of the spiritual narratives that, and the faith narratives that we just came out of. And we're seeking to see what's next of them and what they still have for us and the kind of meaning they can still make for the present and the future. So, I mean, I've been around the block in terms of seminary administrator, Mm -hmm. um, university professor. I've worked with churches and church plants in innovative contexts. I've worked with denominational leadership, you know, because everyone, whether it's in a practical ministerial context or an academic context, everyone is feeling the pinch Mm -hmm. of... The lack of interest in religion across the West and some of the damage that that is doing. And they're all looking to sort of, you know, move into the future, innovate, iterate, reinvigorate, whatever you want to call it. Um, and sometimes they call people like me <laughs> to <laughs> to uh, have some conversations with them and maybe even do, um, you know, a little a little work with them. So that's really been sort of the tenure of, of my career in mm. terms of how I've engaged Christianity at a vocational level. But just recently I came out in the last five months, I've come out with two books and it's been really fun for me and really thrilling. Yeah. There is the first There's one. The one. She's got it all marked yeah. up with the post-its. <laughs> I, know. I felt, I felt kind of funny doing it, but I really wanted to be able to, to reference and I love marking up books. So yep. Got it all tabbed. I'm a I big book marker too. Yeah. hundred percent. I didn't get all the way through it, but what I did, I, yeah, I'm very excited to talk about. So yeah, so you have Safer Than the Known Way and then your new book that just came out on Tuesday. Yeah, it's this one. I'll hold it up since you held up the other one. Reconfiguring. Uh, Reconfiguring, a collection of post-Christian thoughts and theologies. And the first one, Safer Than the Known Way, the subtitle is A Post-Christian Journey. So you'll find um, in the work that I do, it's really all encompassed by this little phrase, you know, post-Christianity. And everyone always sort of asks me what that means. And um, I say, well, read the book. I mean, of course, I have the, (laughs) you know, little elevator pitch, if you want to call it a pitch. I'm not really selling anything, but you know what I mean. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we are going to dive into what what does it mean if God is dead? What does it mean to be post-Christian? What does it mean to be a radical theologian, I think was language that you also used. Yeah. Um, but before we dive into the nitty gritty, I'm curious what you are drinking today, Maria. Yes. Um, well, here's my drink. Mariah asked me if I would definitely have a drink on hand and I would yeah. have anyway. So I'm really glad that we're on the same wavelength, but oh, yeah. it's um, <laughs> nothing super exciting. It's an iced latte decaf coffee uh, with almond milk. I am mm. a no dairy girl. And as of the last several months, I'm a no caffeine girl. And I'm, I just turned 40 this year. I've been drinking caffeine my whole adult life. And I just recently switched to, to decaf uh, for um, some health purposes. So it's kind of a new coffee journey for me. 
normally because Mariah and I are about five hours difference and it's well late into the afternoon in England, even though it's the morning for her, I would Mm -hmm. definitely be having a little cocktail in front of me (laughs) if a podcast host says, bring a fun drink to town. (laughs) Yes. Then you're like, oh, Uh, I will. I will. So you've got the ice latte. (laughs) Yeah. That sounds really good though. It looks really like pretty in your little, like she has like a clear glass or a describe it how would you describe that like a little tumbler like a double walled um really espresso or or coffee glass it's meant for drinking like hot drinks or or anything you just don't want you know your hand to feel the temperature of I suppose Uh, so people can hear the ice kind of clinging around on the microphone I'm gonna take a sip no it's like a little ASMR moment I love it (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) coffee ASMR you know there are so I bring people on the podcast and it almost seems like more often than not people are like yeah I'm cutting back on coffee on caffeine I'm not drinking as much coffee anymore and so I'm like man do I need to be drinking less caffeine is this like something that I need to jump on and I normally just stick to one cup a day maybe decaf later but I do make it pretty strong um so I don't know we'll see I guess I'll wait yeah, until the doc- I, I my- totally get that I was having like multiple cups I was have my one cup in the morning and then eventually I just found that it was really tough on my sleeping mm. and you know, focus and all sorts of things, even if I had that first cup at like 8 a.m. So then I just did this experiment with decaf from beginning till end of the day and it's working for me. So it felt better. Yeah. And I like some people are like, oh, what's the point of decaf? Like, but I love the taste of coffee. So for me, it's like it's about the taste and flavor. So I would not. Yeah, I could maybe switch to decaf. I'll think Same. about it. <laughs> I'll consult with my doctor and see. Well, look what we've already got going on the podcast. You may be switching to decaf. <laughs> oh man, here we go. It's a post- everyone wants to hear about our caffeinated journeys. Though, was, don't they? This is like post caffeinated journey. <laughs> yes, post caffeine Christianity. Oh, that's there's something in there. There's something there in there, Mariah. Coffee theology. I need theology. to tease that out. Yes. <laughs> yep. Oh my goodness. Hello, beloved baddies. A quick break to tell you that this episode is sponsored by the Center for Art, Humor, and Soul, a nonprofit that supports and amplifies the voices of edgewalkers through art that catalyzes change, laughter that brings us together, and soul awakening to the creative spark within us. The support from the Center for Art, Humor, and Soul has meant the world to this podcast, so I highly encourage you to check out their website, arthumorandsoul.com, to see their other featured artists and projects. If you want to support the podcast, you can check out our Patreon or get in touch. Now I'll let you get back to this episode of Called to be Bad. So yeah, wow, where do we even start? Um, So we put the phrase, God is dead, like that's what we're naming the episode. And um, it that phrase comes from a moment that you talked about in your book. Um, And yeah. so we always start the podcast with definitions to kind of develop a shared language um, for this episode. Yeah. And so I'm curious when you talk about like the, uh, the phrase God is dead or um, like what you mean when you say like God is dead or, I mean, you touched a little bit on post-Christian, um, yeah. but yeah, does, is that, is that an okay place to, to start off? Yeah, let's definitely start there. Um, But yeah, so what does it mean that God is dead? That's a really great question. And it's a question that a lot of people have, but it's actually not my phrase, my idea. Mm -hmm. um, And it's not something new. Um, I kind of talk a lot about in my first book, the death of God theologies that came out of the 1960s. And this phrase, the death of God, almost became a household phrase. It was in 1966, a question that was asked on the cover of Time magazine. And it was one of the most popular and audacious and infamous uh, Time magazine covers of all time. And it asked the question, is God dead? And it really just scandalized Mm -hmm. America, Puritan America, you know, the American dream, the white picket fence, the two and a half kids, like the nuclear family, you know, everyone kind of having some kind of Judeo Christian narrative or background. And here you have like one of, you know, the most major publications in the US at the time asking if this God is dead, is the bedrock of this society actually dead and buried and nobody on, on their watch and nobody actually really noticed it. 
And, you know, that comes out of um, a parable told by German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche in the 19th century. And he talked, it's called the parable of the madman. And the story, kind of my paraphrase, you know, this madman, as he's called, runs into the town square and kind of makes this announcement of God being dead and basically says, you know, you're all the murderer of murderers. Um, you've, you've killed God by naming God, by domesticating God, by containing God, by by putting God in all of these places and spaces that God was never meant to be. Mm -hmm. And therefore you have actually killed the God that you said and thought existed and sort of believed in. And it kind of just morphed into, again, the death of God of the 1960s. You had the premier death of God theologians, Thomas Altizer, who just passed in the last few years, Gabriel Vahanian, Paul Van Buren, William Hamilton. Um, these guys were all that first wave of death of God theology. And they weren't atheists and they weren't agnostics, hmm. but they were moving away from theism. And they were actually moving away from the very tired debate of theism versus atheism because essentially they're debating the God that lives in the sky. Does that God mm -hmm. exist or does that God not exist? Does that God have being and personhood or not? And this is something that they moved past and said, this isn't even the point. Mm -hmm. And out of that grew a myriad of various theologies. And now we have what we call radical theology, which I guess it's fair to say it's in its fourth wave from its start in the sixties. And it has morphed and changed a lot. Um, but as you, start the very beginning of my first book, Safer Than the Known Way, I recall a time several years back, I was sitting in a pub in Belfast for a conference. It was a Peter Rollins boutique festival wake and uh, a, a current radical the theologian gets up. His name's Jeffrey Robbins. I'm a big fan of his work. And he gave a lecture. And at the end of it, he said, you know, over a half a century after the death of God, we're not, not quite done with the word God yet. And I think that's post-Christianity. I think that's radical theology. I think that is what we can credit the death of God movement with mm -hmm. to giving us a new imagination for God's future. And when I say God, I mean little G God as opposed to big G God. Yeah, that, that just like blew my mind. I don't know, like the podcast is all about breaking down binaries, uh, you know, good and bad, et cetera. And, and yet somehow I have never heard of the idea that there is more beyond um, like believing in this interventionist God in the sky, theistic belief mm. and atheism. Um, and like mm. you, like, I don't, I don't know that I would fit into either categories. And I loved how you talked about in your book, like if you grew up Christian or if you grew up in some sort of religious tradition and no longer feel like that is home, you can't just like leave that behind. Like that is formed and shamed. Yeah shamed well maybe <laughs> freudian <laughs> slip right? no kidding <laughs> um that is formed and shaped and maybe shamed you and how you view the god and universe and point of life and so where mm. where does that where does that leave you uh so this was incredibly exciting for me i'm like how have i not heard of this before about there there are other options other than agnosticism or or atheism that is a big reason why I wrote the books and why I will continue to write books and continue to do this work is because the one thing that I'm really passionate about, really the point of a lot of my work, um, because I've inhabited the academic mm. spaces and I've inhabited the practitioner spaces and a lot of times those two things don't meet. Yeah. And it's a real shame because there is real powerful and transformative and beautiful thoughts and ideas and theologies and concepts that are just sitting in an ivory tower mm -hmm. somewhere and academics are kind of talking about them and doing their thing, but it never quite makes it to a pop culture yeah. level where it could be really useful and really healing and really formative and really hopeful. And so what I've wanted to do is bridge that gap. And I wanted to take a lot of those ideas and make them available at a pop level, at a popular mm -hmm. level, at a level where, you know, you don't necessarily need tons of theological or philosophical background. I want to break this stuff down for people who need yeah. it most. Um, you know, because when I, when all of this stuff, like, you know, nowadays they call it deconstruction, but when I was going through a lot of these changes 
this wasn't talked about. Social media wasn't like a huge mm -hmm. thing like it is now. Um, you know, even social media has changed a ton, even in the last 10 or 12 years. So you didn't have those online communities and spaces. You didn't have those safe spaces and you certainly didn't have language for it. So I was just going through a f like faith transitions and things were changing for me. And I was just like kind of lost and coasting and trying to figure this all out. And I mean, I'm glad that I sort of had the gumption mm -hmm. and the imagination for a future for myself that I just continued to push myself and figure this all out and acquire degrees and travel and jobs and, you know, opportunity and like all of this stuff. I got some things right. I got some things wrong. Um, but I essentially have written books for, um, well, I, I wrote the book I wish yeah. I had, you know, 10 or 12 years ago that, that I think a lot of people, um, would appreciate. So when you read the books, especially the first book, you're probably going to read it and think, wow, a lot of this resonates with me. And then you're going to read some of it and think, oh, that's really challenging. I don't really understand that, but I, mm -hmm. I want to, I want to stay with this. I want to follow on this journey because something about this is calling to me and I don't know what it is yet. And that's yeah. okay. But, but I, I want to follow its, its whispers in yeah. a sense. And I mean, we were talking about how coffee people can be uber pretentious. Like, don't even get me started about the theological world and like Theo bros. And, and to be honest, I probably wouldn't have read Theo this bro. book if it was like a Theo bro, like telling me about post-Christian thought. Like, I, yeah, but your story, <laughs> um, just was, was gripping and like the part, I'm going to see if I can pull it up really fast. Um, where you talked yeah. about being brave for your future self. I was like, yeah, ah, yeah, that for some reason that just really gets me, especially since like you were saying, like you were going through this at a time where it wasn't like the popular thing to do to deconstruct. Um, and I mean, I, I would love to hear more about your story. Like you were also going through a divorce at, at the time you were going through like faith yeah. crisis and just like uprooting your life like that is an incredibly brave thing to do. Oh, also, okay, I'm going to get ahead of myself, but I also want to touch on, like, uh, taking a break from the girl that had a powerful calling, because, like, as, <laughs> yep, that's why I named the podcast Called to be Bad, because that language was so <laughs> in, okay, so talk about talking bad. about bad, <laughs> yes, so being brave, being bad, bad, and interacting with this calling on your life in a very unexpected way. Yeah, I mean, for me, my my evangelical Christianity was a slow mm. melt. You know, I'll just say for all the listeners out there, the the first book, I really wanted to introduce a lot of the concepts that we're talking about and, and obviously so much more that we haven't even touched on. But the first chapter is really highly autobiographical. And then I get into the next several chapters, all the theological and philosophical stuff with a little bit of my story thrown in. But the first chapter is really autobiographical because I want people to understand where I'm coming from and what my journey has been like and the place I'm at where I can actually say all of this stuff because I've lived through it. I've lived to tell. You know, I'm not just somebody sitting um, in a high tower somewhere reading some books and trying to transmute um that, that information. I've actually lived through it and yeah. toiled through it. And it has been a quick process and it's not nearly over. Like the post-Christian mm -hmm. journey is something that we will, we will always be living post-Christianity till the yeah. day we die <laughs> um, in a sense. So for me, it was a really slow melt, you know, I, and I talk about that in the first chapter, you know, I grew up Catholic in New York. I was part of a really big Italian Catholic family and, you know, mass every Sunday and all the sacraments. And I was really into it because I would go into these and still to this day, you know, I'm, I said earlier, I, I just turned 40 this year and I live in England and I travel all over Europe. You know, I was just in Paris a few days ago and I'm constantly walking into old churches mm -hmm. and cathedrals. There's something about the architecture and the solemnness of it all and the history that just romances me and enchants me. Um, and, and I love it. And I know what it is while mm -hmm. I'm engaging that. But that's sort of another story. Anyway, growing up Catholic, walking into these churches and just kind of looking around and thinking, oh my gosh, there's something in here that's bigger and better than me. And what is it? And I was like, oh, we all have to be quiet because there's something holy in here, but what is it? And then, you know, as I became a teenager, um, I sort of found Jesus in an evangelical charismatic mm -hmm. context. And then all of a sudden, all of those like inner yearnings and wonderings, I was able to put a name to, and that mm -hmm. was Jesus. And then the next, you know, 10 plus years of my life was everything you could think of, you know, in terms of an evangelical youth, like, purity mm. culture and mission trips and being pro-life and 
you know, Jesus being my boyfriend and my best friend. And, you know, I started a Bible club in my high school and I preached every week in my public high school in New York for four years. I mean, like I yeah. was the girl, I was like the it girl. I was the it Christian girl. Um, and I had the most Christian boyfriend <laughs> and we met with our pastor because, you know, we wanted to like do it right. Pure. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I mean, I, I was just, I wanted yep. to be the best. I wanted to be the best and I wanted to love God the most because I just felt like this God loved me <laughs> and went on to Bible college, became even more sort of charismatic and Pentecostal. I went to an Assemblies of God Bible college and then I went to seminary and, you know, I got married, you know, and things kind of, you know, the more you learn, the more you understand, the more you experience life, the more you are sort of, I guess, unguarded and unprotected and unfiltered in the world, the more you develop and the more your epistemologies and your outlook and your interpretive lens really start Mm -hmm. to form. So for me, it was just a a slow melt. You know, I started moving away from charismatic and Pentecostal practices um, in seminary, and I was just mostly kind of a moderate evangelical. And then you know, I really started reading scripture outside of just the, oh, what does Jesus have to say to me today? And it's the Jesus and me story and just kind of flipping and, oh, maybe God mm-hmm. wants this, you know, type of thing today. Um, and I started really looking at scripture as a narrative, as socio-historical documents, as sort of, sort of like this beautiful piece of literature that reflected the times it was written in. And I started to see all sorts of things I didn't see before. And it got me so excited. I was still very much Christian, but I became very progressive evangelical. And I thought, well, you know, maybe justice is something God is concerned with. And maybe, you know, it is okay to be LGBTQ Mm -hmm. and, you know, maybe reproductive rights (laughs) are important. You know, all these things were changing for me. And then eventually I became post-evangelical because I didn't want to be any part of evangelical, even if it was a progressive one. And then I just kept going. I kept following the whispers and, you know, things I was being provoked by and new imaginations that I had for faith in God and what life and meaning making could be. And then I eventually found myself in this post-Christian mm-hmm. space. Yeah. Self-defined Christian space. Yeah. I but, so yeah. identify with a whole, like, oh, I so wanted to be the, like the good Christian girl, like the model Christian girl. Mm-hmm. And especially since I felt this very strong calling of uh, being a pastor. Mm -hmm. And then I had this kind of like, it felt kind of unique of me being, you know, a woman and also being called and, um, and what happens when that calling shifts and changes. And I was dying laughing Mm -hmm. at you saying like, you know, here's the typical, you know, deconstruction journey, perhaps, you know, you go from like evangelical or, you know, maybe more fundamentalist, more kind of black and white thinking. And then you kind of break it open and open. And then all of a sudden you've found yourself like uh, this like liberal Protestant or like my tradition would be Anabaptist Mennonite. And so like a lot of our listeners would be probably more liberal minded, um, maybe Anabaptist Mennonite. And I love that you were like, but I didn't, that wasn't good enough for me either. Like being a liberal Christian, like you were like, it was boring. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is the funniest thing ever. And, um, (laughs) and I love that for this space um, because I get it. And, and, and then if you continue that, you might end up um, maybe like more agnostic or atheist, which there are a lot of people that I talk to that would be in that space. And And like, for me as a pastor, it's such an interesting space to occupy, occupy because like half of me doesn't want to talk about what I actually think about with God. Um, because I don't want my, Mm. the people in my church to be like, okay, she's a pastor. And yet, you know, she doesn't believe in God in the traditional Mm. sense, but with you, I'm not done with God yet. And like, big G, little G, I don't know. Like there is something and and how you used language of awe and following the whispers and like beauty. Like as you were talking, I was like, also I was like, am I going to cry right now? Like getting like emotional because (laughs) like, yeah, I, for me, how I look at life, there is so much like magic and beauty and the, the thing that is like just beyond the words that I can't say mm. like that there is, there is no God, but God does not need to look like, mm. you know, even the, the liberal Christian God or like, even like Jesus. 
um, certainly not fundamentalist um, Santa Claus God, as I like to call it. Uh, but there is something yeah, sure. more that engages me with life that I that I want to put language to, even if it's like the ineffable, you know, the something beyond beyond language. So that's why this yeah. was particularly exciting for me. And I think that a lot of our listeners might be there. Um, and that's a scary place to be if you identify mm-hmm. as, as, as Christian or Anabaptist Mennonite. Um, some people have started saying, yeah, I'm culturally Mennonite, but spiritually, like, I don't, I don't know. So I think, I think some people would be, be ready to take that step. The, the part that, that, and, and then again, I'll stop talking. Um, but the part that gets me when it comes to like the atheist argument from, uh, I don't know, a metaphysical perspective, is that the right word? Is yeah. like, I can yeah. be with people uh, when they're like, okay, you know, everything is random and there's no true, there's no inherent meaning mm-hmm. in, in this world. I'm like, okay, sure, I guess we make our own meaning, fine. Um, but for me, I'm like, but why do we exist in the first place? This is going to make me start sounding like, like I'm like stoned or something. Um, but like, but like, why, no, okay. why are we here in the beginning? Like, why do we exist at all? Like, why is there not just nothing? And like that there's some magic or awe or whispers there that I want to keep chasing. And that's what I found in your book. Um, yeah. Thank you. That's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, there's just so many directions that you can go and, you know, I, I always tell people like when you start shifting your theological landscapes and it starts going more in this direction of like, okay, I'm getting off of this continuum of like God Mm. exists or doesn't exist or, you know, um, scripture is errant Mm -hmm. or inerrant, you know, it's like these, these just weird binary categories that are so one dimensional, so boring, not human Mm -hmm. at all, not storied at all. Like take very little like life and soul into account. Um, but once you start, once you start doing that and once you sort of start shifting, you'll find that these questions Mm. aren't even important. Like they become Mm. just totally moot. You know, I used to, in in the beginning of like all of my, my transitions and kind of when they started happening, you know, I used to, I've, I've always been a bit Mm. of an evangelist, right? So anything I'm excited (laughs) about, I want to tell people. So I was like, this like, Christianity was like the perfect setting for me for like the longest time, like traditional evangelicalism. Like I just wanted to tell everyone mm-hmm. about Jesus and, you know, all of that. Um, and then, so when I started moving on from that and I found light new life in, in different ways and different theological frameworks, I really wanted to share that with people. And, you know, I was kind of innocent at the time about it and maybe even a little naive. And I would go into these spaces and talk and share and I would just mm-hmm. get so attacked and, you know, people, and this is like years ago now, but, you know, people would, ask me questions to trap mm. me. Like, well, do you believe in a literal, literal Adam and Eve? And do you believe the resurrection of Jesus was real or is it just a story? And I'd be like, uh, 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 because what I wanted to say was actually those things are moot points. They don't matter. It's an empirical historical reality. And what we're after is the mm. theological reality here. So I'm not going to talk in physical or metaphysical, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, language and, and spectrums here. I'm, I'm just not doing it at the time I took the bait and, you know, I regret a few things that I've said, you know, in, in my past about that sort of thing. Cause I, I, I just don't even mm-hmm. engage those things now. And that's sort of one of the benefits. And that's sort of one of the many freedoms and liberations that we get to receive as a gift when we move in a post-Christian direction is that we do not have to pay heed to like those pesky apologetic debates and questions. We're, we're just past it. They can go back and forth all they want and we've just transcended it and we've moved beyond it. And, you know, we're, we're ready to, as radical theology would say, sink mm. deep down into the roots and subvert confessional theology. You know, confessional theology is all theology. What we know about God, God is A, B, and C and Christ did, you know, one, two, and three. And, you know, all of the things we actually think we know, Whereas radical theology says, actually, all of this is unknowable and untamable and unnameable and impossible and 
undeconstructable, if you, if you will. Everything can be deconstructed except for the undeconstructible, mm -hmm. and that's never really named. And radical theologian John Caputo would actually say, as much as we do our best to talk about God in an unway, which is actually an apophatic way of speaking about God, it's a negative way of speaking. It undermines the thing it's actually sort of speaking about. Um, ultimately, he says, all language is wounded. It's all wounded language. It's 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 the our best attempt at describing our phenomenological experiences, uh, and and you know we can only go so far right. with that. And just, you know, obviously holding, holding things loosely. So even when people are like, even when people have moved away from God as being in the sky and they want to talk about mm -hmm. God as like the universe or this thing that's in us and with us and in all of us, I still go, no, no, no. Like, <laughs> and that's probably why I really moved past those mm -hmm. liberal spaces. Not that I'm like, you guys have it wrong and I have it right. But for me, I'm just like, no, I'm, I'm moving past anything that you know, I would seek to keep me safe in. Like, I think that's language to keep post-religious people really safe and really comfortable. There's a, what I call a divine deficit there. And that deficit needs to be filled. We had this hole that God filled for a very long time. And we've moved on from that God. And so now, now that hole is filled by the universe with a capital U or love with a capital L or T with a capital truth. Um, but what does it look like to sit in the ruins of all meaning making underlying conscious structures and see what's next mm. for all of this stuff? That is the post-Christian space and it's a journey that never ends and it's a hard one and it's not one you can just snap your fingers and get to the other side of and it takes bravery and commitment and, you know, the willingness to go it alone sometimes and to take risks and to die, to live, to die again, to live again, and waiting on something that may never come, or maybe that has come and has gone again and you missed it. Or do you know what I mean? Willingness to get caught up in a spin at any given moment of the whim yeah. of life. <laughs> um, yeah. No, it's, that, it's that, that, that makes sense. More. See, now, now we feel like we're yes. at the Mad Hatter's tea party because it's just such a I would, crazy I would way of speaking. I would rather be that. nowhere else. I wouldn't rather, uh, you know what I'm trying to say. I want to be here. I want to be in that space. No, mm. I'm, I'm, I, I'm with you in that, like, um, like I'm picturing like, um, like a Lego piece or like a, like an outlet of like, you plug something in. Mm. And so like, when you're in this like evangelical space of like, God is this. And then you have this like plug of like, God is just God, you know, exists in the Bible, whatever. If you unplug that, mm. like you're saying, like there's this void and the temptation is to fill that void mm. again of like, mm -hmm. God is love. God is the universe. And God, uh, God is consciousness it, it experiencing itself or whatever. Um, and, and so you are asking us to like unplug and not, not fill that void. Like, let the void be there. <laughs> yeah, let the void be there. I don't know there. if that makes sense, but I was trying to, like, <laughs> I, like, I was just getting this this picture, and so I didn't know if that was kind of where you were getting at. Because when we fill the void, that can lead us to um, to this kind of circular thinking or fundamentalist thinking of the arguing. And no matter where you yeah. are on the liberal progressive uh conservatives 100 percent. that's fundamental yeah, and i see sides. that and, yeah. and i'm not interested yeah i'm also not interested in the kind of apologetics um but i still want to explore i still want to talk about it and yeah um and there is something engaging enough in like looking at the bible and seeing how people have been doing exactly what we're doing right now for a long time like there's something about the mm -hmm. those kind of ruins of that it this is such an old uh, I don't want to say journey because that feels cheesy this is such an old I don't know practice of like yeah. trying to figure out yeah I don't know life I don't know something yeah well I mean religion has always been humanity's yeah. mechanism for meaning making you know so in that sense nothing has sort of really changed but the interesting thing about desire um and this would kind of get into sort of Freud and Jung and Lacan and, you know, even Deleuze. Um, and I pff, nod to, to those guys in, in the books here and there. Not a lot, but just sort of when it's helpful for mm. talking about desire and lack. You know, we have desire because we desire something. 
And when that something changes or dies, we need something else to be something with a capital S so that our desire continues mm. because it's good to desire. But we're also slave to our desire and it can feel really beautiful to desire and keep us going, but it has us keeping go it has us keep going in a particular direction and it can really squelch imagination for what else might be there if our desire is always desiring in a particular direction of a particular capital S something. When you say, as you said, mm. I'm just gonna sit in the void and let the void be for a little bit, and you like rip out the root of like that capital S something, all of a sudden your desire kind of just vaporizes. It's just like poof, because it's like you, you're, you finally, you have finally been freed from all that you think you desire, even though you don't know what's at the end of the journey. Do you know what I mean? In Christianity, you're promised, you know, wholeness and heaven and eternity and all of these things. And maybe when you move past that, you know, you're promised a healthy, happy life and, you know, you're, you're living more mm. integrated as a human or, you know, whatever, whatever language people want to use after certain religious constructs. The moment you take that something out of the picture, or at least you realize that it's an illusion that can never be apprehended anyway, and your desire sort of starts to fade away, that's when you're really free to sort of experience the future and your life and community and relationships and meaning making in ways that you really never thought possible. And that's why when radical theology talks about language as, or God, little g God, uh, and when we say God, we're basically just using a noun to, <laughs> um, you know, mm -hmm. describe all of this. And we're just slapping the word God on there, but that's why the, the word impossible versus impossible is so powerful and so meaningful in, in that conversation because all of a sudden we have an imagination for the impossible as opposed to our desire on the road to just what we thought might have been possible. And it's a beautiful way to live. It mm -hmm. can be really scary and it can be really unknown, um, but that's mm -hmm. like the whole idea of the title of my book, Safer Than the Known Way. There's a known way that people have found safety and comfort and assuredness and certainty in. But when you move off of that path, even though it might be dark and even though you may not even have enough light to, to see where your feet are trotting, it is still safer than the known way. It is still safer to go out into that chaotic darkness of unknowing and not knowing um, than to sort of stay put. So yeah, I mean, I know it sounds like a lot of, I don't know, I guess a conversation like this could sound really sort of airy fairy, you yeah. know, talking about all of this, like blow up your desire and, you know, what's next and little G God and whatever. But, um, in the book, I get fairly specific about theological frameworks that could give us new imaginations for the future and what new language around this stuff might look like mm -hmm. and the history of some of it. And, you know, what we see happening with Christianity in the West and certainly in the United States that, you know, is, is really causing the present and the future of God and faith to crumble and why that's precisely where we need to be in order to sort of build mm -hmm. a new one. If we even want to build a new one and what that might look like, um, you know, I, I break down what deconstruction actually really might be a la Derrida and some other scholars and why it's actually so much more transformational and moving and beautiful and magical um, than we actually give deconstruction credit for and how we really don't have mm. the, there's, there's no promise. Do you know what I mean? Necessarily like the promise mm. is the breaking free, you know, the promise is new life, but unlike Christianity where there's always sort of a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, like you do this for the sake yeah. of it. But it's okay, as you said earlier, the girl with the powerful calling on her life to be this leader and to do this great thing. Like, it is okay for me to just say, fuck all of that. <laughs> and for the first time, I'm going to put myself first and I'm not going to be impressive. I'm not going to mm. do these amazing things. I'm just going to sit in this space for however long the fuck it takes. Mm. <laughs> Can I curse on you? Okay. It's called to be bad. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and I did. And I, actually within a within a year of me kind of, and, and the thing was, it was crazy because, um, I, I had a great job. I was working at a seminary high up in administration. I was traveling all the time. I was building, 
you know, new relationships. I was even, you know, I was working on a, a school of theology with a group of, you know, academicians and theologians. And I mean, I had my hands in tons of Christian stuff. Mm. Um, but I myself personally, outside of my vocation and what I thought about all of this stuff, I was just going to coast and I didn't care what anybody said or anybody thought about it. And a lot of people thought I was crazy. A lot of people thought I had like lost my faith or even like lost my mind in a sense. But, and that's why like in this deconstruction conversation, you know, I see people turn it around so fast and not that it cannot be done and not that everybody's journey has to look like mine, certainly not. But when you spend half of your life, you know, in a particular context of religion that is so deeply embedded, and that's why this is also crisis ensuing, because it's not just a category of, or a part of who we are. Mm -hmm. It's usually all of who we are. It's so foundational that when those foundations start to crack and start to be interrogated and interrupted, we're thrown in total identity crisis because it's all we are. Something that took us so long to ravel into, it's going to take us more than a blip to unravel. Yeah. Sort of. Yeah. Um, from, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, I mean, for me, I, I'm, I'm always very upfront about the fact that I am so not looking to poke holes in people's faith. I'm so not looking to send anyone into crisis hmm. You know, my, my stuff, my work, my books, everything I do is written for people who are already like moving out of those spaces okay. and, and are just like, oh my God, what, what do I do now? Mm. One of the questions that usually comes up in these conversations is, okay, so you're, you're post God, like, what does that mean for mm -hmm. Jesus? Um, and being post God, being post Christian, being post theist, as opposed to theist or atheist does not mean post faith and it doesn't mean post Jesus and it doesn't mean post Jesus mattering. Mm. And, you know, Jesus Christ of Nazareth is a huge figure of interest and intrigue to me. And post-Christianity, or as a post-Christian who engages Jesus differently these days, what that looks like is I've just reoriented myself to Jesus and to Christianity. The directionality at which I come at all of this stuff has shifted and it's changed. Um... And I, I, I have two chapters actually devoted to Jesus and engaging Jesus in my first book and what that might mean, what that might look like. Because, you know, people co-opt Jesus all the time from both sides, from the conservative and, and liberal end of the spectrum. You know, and they, they both sides imbue Jesus with their own qualities, good qualities and bad qualities. And just because Jesus, you know, just because the liberal progressive side of Christianity gives Jesus amiable, noble qualities doesn't mean that that's who Jesus is. It just means that we've made him the poster child for good and noble values. Um, you know, and I, and I talk about sort of, because you can be a humanitarian and do all of those things, mm -hmm. but what is the Christian difference? Why the Christian and post-Christian? And why the post and post-Christian? So Jesus is still a super important part of this equation. It's why we're post-Christian and not just post-religion or post Islam or post Judaism or Buddhism or any of those other things. Um, and so I talk a lot about what it might look like to engage Jesus differently. And it's not novel, but people I think are always a little surprised by it because we're taught you either engage Jesus as like personal savior and model human, <laughs> depending on which side of things you're on. Um, either Jesus is kind of like the savior who died on the cross, penal substitutionary atonement, took your sins and was resurrected. And now you're going to be with him someday. Or he is the peace loving pacifist hippie, um, you know, who the like of the likes of Nick Cave calls a bloodless placid mm. savior. But Jesus has to be more than both of those things. <laughs> um, so, so what does it look like to, to really engage Jesus? And I think that's a really important part of this mm -hmm. conversation. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's <laughs> incredibly helpful. Like you said, we're not done. We're not done with, with God yet. And what does that mean for, for Jesus? And the thing is, if we take the personhood and the being of God, the big G God off the table, then that changes everything for like the son of God, doesn't it? And his divinity and his humanity. We no longer have to be like, well, how human was Jesus and how divine was Jesus? And, you know, like, did, did he die or did God die or did they both die? And what does the Trinity have to do mm. with all of this? And I talk about Trinity and some of that stuff in my second book. Um, but it, again, like I said earlier, it makes a lot of these like 
theological pissing mm-hmm. contests totally moot because you it is it's like a a dog chasing its tail it's just you're going round and round in a circle um and it should be sort of more of a spiral into the future that every time we go around we should be in a slightly different place mm. and know or unknow <laughs> a little bit more yeah i like that imagery of like a circle versus a spiral like we don't need to yeah. go just around and around and around like what can take us a little bit deeper each time and I think, yeah. like, I think, yeah. like, reflecting on this, on this podcast and the work I'm doing, um, spiritually, theologically, whatever, there, mm-hmm. there might be some, some circle work, you know, um, sure. and what can take us deeper. And I think your calling mm-hmm. of <laughs> calling, sorry, uh, my Christian is showing, <laughs> oh, I think your, 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 <laughs> I love, oh, that's so good. <laughs> your, your, uh, my vision yeah. is showing. My, That's you're good. beckoning us a little bit deeper mm. uh, into this space of, you know, this is unknown. This is impossible. This is the void. And mm-hmm. we can find safety here. Or would it be mm-hmm. fair to say, like, safety doesn't have to be our utmost concern. Like, we we can sit in this discomfort, in this unsafe, unpredictable, unknown space and ask these questions and it will be okay. Like we will be okay. If we're saying, I don't know where I am with God. I don't know where I am with Jesus. I don't know why, where I am with Christianity, but I'm not ready to let go. Like I'm still wanting to wait. I'm still wanting to do this, this, this spiral work. Um, and that's, I, yeah, I just, I just really love that because it doesn't have to be Christian or atheist or theist or a, you know, non whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and the interesting thing about kind of, you know, what you said is like the not ready to let go. Like, you know, I've had conversations with people about this kind of stuff before and they're like, oh, you're just, you know, you're just a poser. You're just not ready to like move, really move past it all. And, and you know, you're just sort of trying to make this work for you or whatever. And that's actually not true at all. Like I'm living into my mm-hmm. humanity. I'm living into my story. I'm living into lots of stuff that I invested a lot of time in that like I intuitively and integrally know I'm not done with and that isn't quite done with me. Um, Going back to Jeffrey Robbins, I I started the book with a quote from him and I sort of end the book on a note from him as well, but he talks a lot about the plasticity of God. Mm. And this concept is really interesting and it's one that I've been wowed by for a lot of years since I heard it. And in, um, in my master's work, I did a lot of research around brain mm. function and the social brain and what it looks like when we form around certain narratives and shared shaping stories. And I came across the term neuroplasticity years before I heard Jeff Robbins talk about it in a theological context. And it's this idea that our environments and the social stimuli that were around shape us. And that our brains can actually be healed by the communities we find ourselves in, the context we find ourselves in, because what those things do is they tell us Mm -hmm. new stories um, and they can tell new healing stories over the toxic and traumatic ones. And this flies in the face of so much, you know, um, I guess, brain statistics, not, not statistics, but, um, neuro and not even really research, but like, I guess, Mm. guesstimations and estimations over the last century when it comes to brain function, where people have said, you know, up until you're this age as a child, your brain is malleable and can be formed, um, in a certain way. But after that, if you've had a trauma or if you're broken in some way, your best bet is therapy because you're always just going to walk with a limp. It's always going to be there. And towards the end of the 20th century, all these neurologists kind of came to the fore with all this new research and said, no, that's actually Mm -hmm. all wrong. Like our brains are actually plastic and they're given to plasticity and that we can actually build new synapses and new neural pathways over the old ones. And not that you ever rip out the trauma, but you can heal it by telling new stories to yourself, to your brain. And, and and that's not like speaking stories, like they're once, you know, once upon a time type thing, but it's the stories that we sort of live out every day and it can change and transform physiologically and biologically speaking our brains. And this is amazing. And I read this, like, 
I remember reading it and I was like, oh my God, this is just incredible. And at the time I was like really thinking about what Paul was writing in, in his letter to the Romans. And when he talks about be transformed by the renewing of your mind, I'm like, oh my God, that's actually physically <laughs> possible. It's not just a spiritual idea that can actually happen. And so, so many years later, when I came across Robbins and him talking about the plasticity of God, he's talking about how like, like the, the, the idea of God and, and who and what and where and when God might be is actually plastic, that it actually takes different forms. The idea of plasticity, it, um, it does mean in a sense that, you know, God can't be God one day and then a pen the next day, right? That's not how plasticity works. The brain can't be the brain one day and then the liver okay. the next. That's not okay. how neuroplasticity works. So in that sense, it is... I guess to use the word connected, connected to a certain shaping story, a narrative, but that narrative would be the Judeo Christian one, right? That's why mm -hmm. we're post Christian and not post religion or really post anything else, because we're still finding meaning mm -hmm. in this story. But like I said earlier, when I was talking about Jesus, we've just shifted our orientation to it. We've changed the direction from which it flows and from which we flow, flow yeah. to it. Yeah. I got so excited when you started talking about neuroplasticity and, and like, cause I was, I was like right there with you. I was just about to take us into like, this is like trauma work. This is like, this yeah. is healing work. And, and so if you view Christianity as, as trauma in that it, like it changed us, mm -hmm. it impacted us. This is kind of the, like, like talk about trauma is like, like something happened in your brain and we have to metabolize mm. that. Like we have to work through that. Mm. So this is kind of like the metabolizing work, um, of Christianity. Mm. And, and that doesn't mean that we mm. then arrive maybe at a new, at a new place, but like, can we sit in that, in that metabolizing? metabolizing work. Does that make sense? Or am I just like putting a new confusing metaphor on there? No, I love that. I, I haven't used that word metabolize in that way. So I really like it. Yeah. Yeah, I, think I did not come up with that. Um, I'm trying to think of which trauma person I read. I don't know if that was like the body keeps a score. If he talked about which isn't the best book oh, on, sure. on trauma, but it is a, a book and can be re traumatizing for some people. So I'm, yeah. Um, Got it. or if that was my grandmother's hands, if that like talk of talking about tra yeah. metabolizing trauma, we can't just slough off our past, whether it's Christian, whether it's, you know, I don't know, whatever tradition you come from, like, we can't just like check it at the door. We have to like, it is our, not that we have to, like, we are already interacting with that. So how do we do that in a way that like yeah. takes us deeper is kind of, is that, is yeah. that a fair assessment of like the, the work that you're doing? Yeah. In fact, yeah. The, the funny thing about what you said is, you know, you, you use the phrase, not mm. just check it at the door. And that is a mm. phrase I use mm -hmm. all the time. Like we do not have to check our spiritual or Christian or whatever you want to say narratives at the door just because it's changed. Like that's where the crisis ensues. And that's why a lot of people stay in places that they don't feel comfortable in, or they don't feel like they fit, or they don't feel like belong, like they belong. Like, so they either move from like a really kind of rigid traditional Christian space to an atheist space, which they don't feel like they belong in at all, but they just don't feel like they have any, that's like yeah. their default option. Or they go back to where it was really comfortable but theologically, they just can't hack it because it just doesn't, it, it doesn't mm -hmm. make sense to them. It doesn't resonate. It's not meaningful. Like, um, and so they, they really feel forced to check that, that narrative at the door and they just don't have to. Um, Post-Christian means it's this continuous journey. And even though, you know, it's a rocky one and it's a dark one and it can be a painful one, it's also really beautiful. And in some ways mm -hmm. it's seamless. You know, when I look back on my own journey, um, the, the thread that I see running throughout it all is curiosity, you know, and, and amazement and just like always after what was next. I really love that word curiosity because that feels like a safe exploring play 
place Mm -hmm. um, out Mm -hmm. of which we, you know, interact with. Like, that's my whole thing with, like, with Called to be Bad is, like, can we explore, can we interact with these different bad or unsafe, if we want to use that language, um, ideas, and can we do it in a way that is, yeah, we're, like, we're wallowing in the dark, but it's okay. Like, it's, I don't know, God is there, too. However you think of God or not God or, you know, like, I mean, curiosity, curiosity is a great word. And again, I I talk about curiosity a lot in terms of the phrase Mm, curiosity killed the cat. And so in this sense, it has a bit of a negative connotation. And I talk about in the the first chapter, because it's autobiographical, like all the questions I had growing up as a young girl, then a teenager, and then more of a young adult that nobody wanted to answer, that nobody could answer. And how you eventually get trained from growing from child to sort of adolescent and so on and so forth. You get trained out of asking questions. You get conditioned to sort of be question free and sort of to just accept the status quo. And it really squells imagination and it squells new thought and new life and anything that could be beyond, you know, what you've been told actually is. So I think curiosity is a really key Mm -hmm. value and ethos for this kind of work and faith and journey and yeah. certainly for the future. I love it. Um, I mm-hmm. want to read part of your book uh, because it reminded me of uh, my, my dad was, was a pastor and he, he's a pretty, he's pretty in touch mm-hmm. with his emotions and he would often cry like during, during his sermons, mm-hmm. often when he was telling stories about me and my sister. And it was just a great model of like, it's okay to cry mm-hmm. in church. It's okay to, to, you know, have these emotions. It's okay to cry in church, out of church, anywhere. And so I just love this because you talk about um, it's okay to cry in the chapel. So you say it's okay to cry in the chapel, both figuratively and literally. It's okay to sit in that cathedral or stand in that church and cry for all the ways it has let you down, let you and the world down. It's okay to cry because you still find hope. It's okay to cry because you still see beauty. And it's okay to cry because you feel nothing where you once felt so many somethings because you aren't alone. We cry and sob and weep and wail together through life. Our human condition is too beautiful and full of ache not to. Like, just, yeah, exactly that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Crying in the chapel. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Uh, a life sort of metaphor for me. I think in some sense, anyone who comes out of a particular strand of Christianity, maybe like all, all strands of Christianity will always sort of be Mm. weeping in a chapel of sorts in their, in their hearts, you know, either happy tears or sad tears or grief tears or whatever. Um, yeah. Gosh, I just love that so much. (laughs) Um, yeah, well, thank you so much, Maria, for coming on and, and sharing your thoughts and that invitation to just be curious and interact with your words and it doesn't have to be this quick fix. Cause like you said, like quick fixes work until they don't, you know, and then you're just, you know, you're going yeah. in circles or like, how can we, how can it be a spiral and, and go, go a little bit deeper. Um, and the, the permission yeah. to interact with that, that grief and that trauma, almost that like church wound or Christian wound. Um, and how can, how can we continue to like, um, I don't know, metabolize that, that trauma, that interact with that, that God yeah. that may or may not be dead. I don't know. Who knows? But we do metabolize that God, don't we? Do you know what I mean? And like, what, and what do you do when we, you metabolize anything? Like metabolize it turns into energy, God. right? But like our energy, not the energy of the thing. Mm. Um, so that's sort of cool. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. We've got more work to do here, Mariah, I think, you and I. Yeah. Oh, always. Um, It's tradition on the podcast to um, end with a blessing. So would it be okay if I bless you, Maria, and all of our baddies out there? Um, Well, I actually want to use your own blessing, which I don't don't often do, but I just thought it was so beautiful. Um, (laughs) And that sounded sarcastic, but it wasn't. I just said it in a a weird way, but now I'm not going to be able to find it. Oh, here we go. Okay. So... um, 
Maria said in, in her book, she said, I don't pray as it is traditionally defined, but if I did, my prayer for you would be that you always, that you are always in awe, always seeking as much as finding, and that you're haunted by the hope of cathedral ruins as you build, rebuild, live, and let live. Excellent. So let that be thank our blessing you. for today. Yeah, thank you so much, Maria, for coming on. This was a really fun conversation. We just, we, we skimmed the surface. There's so much <laughs> more spiral work that we could have done, but hopefully this just whets people's appetite to to do more work in this like post-Christian, post-theist God, you know, radical theology. There's so many names for the work that you do. It's hard to like pin it down, but maybe that's the point. Um there, there's a lot in there for sure. Yeah. Yeah. If I could just say one quick thing before Absolutely, we, we head out here, oh my I just want to say that if um, anybody's interested in interacting with me mm-hmm. past the the books and that kind of thing, um, you can head to my website, mariafrancescafrench.com. And there are tons of ways to interact. I have a Patreon. I do theological coaching where I actually have conversations with people each month and help them work through a lot of their their theological conundrums uh, <laughs> yes. and, and things like that. So um, yeah, if you, and I have a lot of other projects I'm involved in as well um, outside of the, the writing of the book. So yeah, you can head to my website if you're interested in any of that, or if you just want to say hi yeah, as a way to do that. I too. love that. Sorry. I forgot to do the good pos- podcasting question of like, Maria, where, where can we find you? And yeah. I will likely do a book giveaway when we release your podcast. Well, I'll tell you what, Mariah, um, I will up the ante on your book giveaway. I will say give away two books. Okay. I will personally send them to the recipients, personalized and signed from England via Royal Mail. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I love it. That's that's exciting. That's how much I love my readers. And that's how much Mm -hmm. I have loved this podcast with you. Let's do two personalized signed books of Safer Than the Known Way. Uh, to readers of, oh, of your that's choice. That's exciting. That's exciting. This is like, honestly, I started this like very selfishly because I love books and reading so much. And I'm like, I just want to like meet all my favorite <laughs> authors and any, any like good thinkers that I can like sit down and virtually have coffee with. Like I want to do it. So love it. And it turns out other people like that too. So. <laughs> that's all for this episode of called to be bad. Keep being your bad, beautiful selves. And I will see you next time.